Hello, I'm Dr. Kellen McNulty, one of the veterinary researchers working with the Dog Aging Project. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Dr. McNulty. Hey. Um, I'm <laughs> and I'm Harmony Peraza, the study participant manager of the Dog Aging Project. It's great to see you guys. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us today. We really appreciate the active participation from so many of our Dog Aging Project PAC members. Um, just to give you an idea, so PAC members are those community scientists who have not only nominated their dog to participate in our study, but have also completed all of the tasks in their personal research portal. Um, and this particular event is part of our monthly series of kind of exclusive activity for our PAC members. Um, we also have a Q&A session taking place uh, simultaneously on the dog park, which is our online community forum for PAC members. And, but that being said, um, the recording of this event will eventually be available to the general public to watch after the event has ended. That's right, Dr. McNulty. And if you know a fellow dog lover who might want to join us in this exciting and groundbreaking research, it's not too late for them to join the pack as well. Um, recruitment is definitely ongoing. Um, we would ask that they go on to dogagingproject.org. The nominate button is a big purple button. Um, even though we are talking about senior dogs specifically today, please know that the Dog Aging Project is seeking to enroll all sorts of dogs of all ages, all health statuses, all breeds, all sizes from all parts of the United States, especially puppies. We'd love to see puppies included as well. We're gonna learn a lot from those guys. Um, although the aim of the study is to understand the biological and environmental factors that influence aging, in order to truly understand this question, we need to study a vast array of dogs. So please, again, all your friends, all your colleagues, have them nominate one dog from their household, again, all across the United States. We're, we're welcoming everyone. That's right, exactly. And give you guys kind of a brief overview of the project. You know, the vast majority of our study here at the Dog Aging Project is called an observational longitudinal study. And what that means, so observational, meaning that we simply collect observations about participating dogs, such as their age, their weight, their exercise habits, et cetera, without really interfering in the dog's life in any way. And then longitudinal, meaning that we collect those same observations multiple times over the entire lifespan of the dog. And most of these observations are collected by you, our awesome participants, um, in answering the survey questions that we send to you guys about your dogs. But there also will eventually be some kind of exciting activities mixed in as well, such as mobility tasks, cognitive tasks, where you get to carry out kind of fun, um, you know, pre-planned activities that we have for you guys with your pup, and you get to contribute to exciting scientific research all at the same time. That's right. So just as a quick reminder, um, if you're not already a PAC member, or if you know someone who isn't already a PAC member, please have them head over to dogagingproject.org and sign up their dog, all sorts of dogs from all parts of the country. That's right. And we hope you'll stick around with us today um, after Harmony and I um, answer some questions from the dog park. Um, Amber Kaiser will be joining us to give you kind of a glimpse behind the scenes at the Dog Aging Project and show you guys kind of what our team is up to currently and what sort of fun projects lie ahead. That's right. Thanks so much, Dr. McNulty. Well, um, it's going to be an exciting next half hour. We're going to discuss a lot about our senior pet care today. We've received lots of questions about caring for older dogs on the dog park forum and through emails from our PAC members. We weren't able to answer all of your questions during our last two PAC appreciation events, so we want to cover some of the topics that you've raised with today's presentation. We'll also answer a few more questions after the presentation. If you are a PAC member and you have a question about the care of a senior dog or the Dog Aging Project in general, please head over to the Dog Park Forum to post your questions. We want to hear from you, please do that. Members of our team will be responding there. Uh, please remember that while our team includes, while our team does include veterinary professionals, we can't offer medical advice 
for your specific dog. And we do that because your dog is so unique and there are so many special circumstances with everyone's dog that those decisions and that advice is best um, made by your dog's personal veterinarian that has intimate knowledge of their very specific medical needs um, and their medical history. So um, the most important thing that we're focusing on today, senior pets, we all love them. I've got a senior dog. Um, Dr. McNulty, if I recall, you've had a couple of very special senior dogs in your, in your life. Yeah, in fact, I've had two really wonderful senior pets in my life. Um, the first one being Lady, um, a Border Collie mix, and the second being Carmel, a Cocker Spaniel Poodle mix. Um, so Lady has since uh, passed away several years ago, um, and Carmel's getting up there in age, but he's still doing pretty well, although he's currently now uh, deaf to just about anything other than a really, really high-pitched whistle. Um, and so some of the things we're going to talk about is and there's quite a number of changes that occur in our older pets as they age. Some of them are relatively benign and don't seem to, you know, significantly impact their quality of life, you know, such as Carmel's loss of hearing, you know, for him, as long as he can still inhale his food, like it's the last meal he's ever going to eat and then come over and snuggle with us afterwards, he doesn't seem to particularly care if he can hear or not. Um, but then there's other changes that we see in senior pets that are more problematic and do significantly impact their quality of life, um, such as Lady and her really severe osteoarthritis that she had. So for her, she would much rather go for a good long walk than eat her dog food. So for her, when her arthritis began to really compromise her mobility, despite you know, all of our best efforts at pain management with multiple pain medications, you know, other supportive changes such as, you know, we installed a ramp um, out the back door. We use little gripping booties on her paws to help her get traction on the floor. So when those interventions weren't enough, you know, her quality of life really was notably compromised. Although thankfully those interventions that I just mentioned um, did allow us to manage her osteoarthritis and give her a good quality of life for quite some time. So those are my two pups. Uh, Harmony, I think you have a senior pup as well, a German Shepherd, right? So, you know, what kind of special accommodations does he need? Yeah, Dr. McNulty, thank you for mentioning Ovoy. He's also a very important member of our household. He's a retired canine officer and he's, he's great with our little boy. Um, being 12 years old, Ovoy has been diagnosed with some osteoarthritis and a, also a degenerative condition in his spine, much like your lady. Um, and his veterinarian has recommended a protocol of anti-inflammatory medication, low impact exercise, and you know we pay close attention to his diet as well to keep his weight healthy. Um, you know, all that being said, um, we additionally take steps in our home to alter the environment for old boy's supreme comfort. <laughs> um, we've got lots of rugs down on our tile floors, and those have a non-skid backing, so his traction, um, he has the greatest traction possible at all times. We also have a lot of soft surfaces for him to lay on. Uh, such as dog beds and little pallets just here and there. It's really the um, ultimate environment for a special senior boy. Um, because he's on anti-inflammatory medication and because he's a senior dog, we, um, my family and I definitely follow his veterinarian's recommendation of monitoring his internal organ function through twice or more annual, twice a year, you know, blood work um, to make sure internal organ function is as it should be. And it alerts us if any changes need to be made with circumstances in his life. So we get an early look at that. Yeah, those are absolutely awesome suggestions from your family veterinarian, Harmony. Um, you know, as we both mentioned for Lady and oh boy, you know, many older, especially large breed dogs, um, similar to aging humans, really struggle with osteoarthritis. You know, fortunately by, you know, supporting them and facilitating their mobility with environmental modifications, such as the couple things we mentioned, you know, ramps and area rugs, maintaining a healthy weight and strong muscles and good muscle condition. And then also treating the discomfort um, caused by this condition with anti-inflammatories and other pain medications. 
a lot of times we're able to manage this condition and maintain an older dog's good quality of life for you know, a good amount of time. Um, if you guys want some more helpful tips and tricks for older dogs that have mobility challenges, I'd invite you to check out um, a blog that I posted. Um, it's called Mobility Tips and Tricks for Senior Dogs. And so all the blog posts that I discuss in this talk um, can be found at the Dog Aging Project website. So dogagingproject.org and it's under the stories tab is where you can find these blogs. So myself and my colleague, um, Gray Barnett, another veterinarian, um, have written several blog posts specifically targeting you know, our senior pups. And I feel like two of the biggest questions that I'm often asked um, from owners is, you know, first, when is their pup considered a senior? And then if their pup is a senior, what kind of changes should be made such as diet, exercise, routine, things of that nature. Um, and so we actually got two specific questions um, from a couple of dog park members, um, one being Teddy's mama and the other Smiley Miley, who were asking about, you know, diet changes and exercise changes for their pups. Um, but before we dig into that, let's kind of talk about that first question that I mentioned. So in general, as I'm sure most people are aware, you know, larger breed dogs age faster than smaller breed dogs, such that, you know, some of the giant ones, you know, Great Danes, Irish Wolfhounds, can be considered seniors as early as around six years of age, um, whereas the little tiny nuggets like Chihuahuas, you know, Maltese, the little guys, um, aren't generally considered seniors until they're around 10 years of age, possibly even a little bit older. Um, I go into a little bit more specifics on a separate blog post um, called Beyond Gray Muzzles Defining Aging in Dogs, and it kind of gives you some idea um, for various dog breeds how to get an idea of whether they have reached senior status yet. So once we know that a pup has you know, reached their golden years, there's some general changes that veterinarians recommend for these dogs. And one of the most notable changes for a senior pup is the recommendation to have the dog examined by a veterinarian and perform baseline lab work at least every six months. So just as Harmony had mentioned um, for her pup. And the reasoning for this, as I mentioned, dogs age faster than humans. So an older dog going to the veterinarian every six months is roughly equivalent to a geriatric human being seen by their primary care doctor every two to three years. And so as you can imagine, and I'm sure many of you have seen, you know, a lot can happen in that span of time. Um, additionally, you know, many disease processes in older dogs have a really subtle or gradual onset that might not have any obvious signs that you would necessarily notice at home but may be picked up with a thorough veterinary examination and lab work. And the earlier that we can detect the problem, the more likely we're going to be able to treat it or manage it successfully. Now, it's not to say that there aren't some disease processes that are real sneaky and can evade even a good thorough physical exam and baseline lab work, but most of the common diseases can at least be suspected um, and then investigated further with this basic assessment every six months. Um, if you'd like a little bit more information on this particular topic, um, check out the American Animal Hospital Association. They have um, online senior care guidelines for both dogs and cats um, that is free that you guys can access. And I also, as always, highly recommend you to speak with your primary care veterinarian on this topic as they'll really be the best equipped to give you specific recommendations for your individual dog. Um, so that's basically, you know, the nutshell of how do we know if our dog is a senior and how do we go about, you know, getting them seen by their veterinarian. So let's talk about diet and exercise. So just as senior dogs are unique individuals, so too are both their dietary and exercise requirements. And so the best way to choose an appropriate diet for your aging dog is as always first to have them evaluated by your veterinarian, um, because you're looking for any important changes such as weight loss, you know, muscle loss, diseases such as chronic kidney disease, osteoarthritis, that would specifically warrant a change in their diet, you know, going to a senior diet, going to a prescription diet, or possibly even adding in some dietary supplements. Um, but if no specific abnormalities or diseases are seen with your dog's evaluation, then I really recommend you to talk with your veterinarian about your dog's past medical history, their current level of activity, their tolerance of you know, ever having their food changed in the past, 
and then any other concerns that you have. So all of that information taken together can really help your veterinarian to guide you as to whether it's appropriate to keep your dog on their current diet or potentially transition them to a different diet, such as potentially a senior diet. So for instance, for my boy, Carmel, um, he has no current health issues. He's at a healthy weight. He has good muscle condition, but he has really significant food allergies um, that are currently really well controlled on the diet that he has eaten, I kid you not, every single day of his life for 13 years. And yes, let me reassure you that he does not seem to mind the lack of variety and still eats his food like it's going to disappear any moment. Um, and so I have not switched him to a senior diet, although he is 13, because it appears that his current adult diet is maintaining him as far as his physical condition, his muscle condition, and his lab work. And honestly, I fear that, you know, changing his diet will cause a flare in his allergies. Now, the caveat being, if I did ever find something such as he's showing signs of developing chronic kidney disease, that absolutely would warrant a change in his diet. So then I would just need to kind of balance things and choose a diet and make a transition plan for him that hopefully both supports his kidneys and avoids angering his allergies. So that's kind of the basics of uh, diet. So then let's talk a little bit about exercise. So regarding exercise, as I'm sure in talking to older humans have, you know, told you in the past that, you know, the longer they're immobile, the harder it is to get back to normal activity and normal movement. So the same is true for our older pups. Um, you know, frequent controlled exercise is really beneficial in maintaining a healthy weight um, and appropriate muscle condition and, you know, joint mobility in senior dogs. However, <laughs> It is certainly necessary at times to modify the activity in those pups that don't seem to want to believe that they are in fact senior citizens. Um, so for instance, my girl lady, as I mentioned, she absolutely loved going for long adventurous walks. And as she got older, we began to notice that while she wouldn't show us any signs of slowing down during our actual walk, the following day, she would be extremely stiff and sore and have difficulty getting around. So. You know, we were forced to limit her walks despite her protest that she could keep going. Um, and so in general, for older dogs, I would recommend, you know, frequent short leash walks at a gentle pace and ideally on flat ground. And then ultimately, you know, if they ever get to the point like Lady did towards the very, very end, um, that they're really no longer able to be mobile hardly at all, um, even with supportive care, um, one thing we did for her is we actually adapted a little child's wagon or cart and, and put her in there and secured her in there and took her for little walks around the neighborhood um, that way. And she really loved that. You know, it's, oftentimes these guys just love being outside, especially ones who have loved going on walks for their whole life. So, you know, even if they can't take themselves for walks, you know, we can sometimes take them for them. Yeah, Dr. McNulty, you bring up bring up some good points there um, in alterations to exercise. Um, not only can we alter their exercise for their happiness and their well-being, um, it can also be helpful to modify their environment. You know, for these sweet mobility challenge senior dogs, um, we've discussed a lot of these alterations that we've done ourselves for Lady and for Old Boy. Um, and those, again, can include and really should include for these arthritic babies, soft surfaces to lay on. Um, and not only soft surfaces, but including ramps to get into vehicles for veterinary appointments or easy trips to the dog park, as well as pet stairs. Pet stairs can be purchased online or through you know, certain pet stores. And they're typically carpeted small sets of stairs that can help dogs continue to be able to enjoy the couch if that is allowed <laughs> in their regimen um, or to get onto their owner's beds. Um, we find it is easier on them than an aggressive jump from the floor to the top of this piece of furniture. So including the small sets of pet stairs is a great addition. Some dogs are a little bit hesitant to try new things like steps and stairs, and it actually brings about a very special opportunity to engage them cognitively. 
a lot of dogs are food driven and reward driven. Um, and we recommend just a simple luring technique of a very delicious treat that the pets love, luring their nose, the little pup, right up the ramp or right up the stairs. They receive the treat once they've done this and it provides a very positive association with this new device. It's a great alternative for these older guys. Yeah, Harmony, totally agreed, totally agreed. A lot of those um, devices can really be helpful to these older guys, especially with the ones that have arthritis. Um, so my only final comment, you know, regarding general senior dog care that we have time to discuss today is that actually, as opposed to making any changes, it's actually quite important to continue with actually the same preventative care strategies that your dog received when they were younger, such as vaccinations, flea, tick, heartworm, and other parasite preventions, unless your veterinarian instructs you otherwise. Um, and there's several other you know, tips and tricks um, for monitoring and caring for senior dogs. Again, one more blog post to mention um, that I wrote, preventative care for senior pets, uh, senior dogs specifically, um, that you can find on our website. And additionally, you know, again, as always, I encourage you to speak with your primary veterinarian about any questions or concerns that you have for your aging pup to really help develop a strategy that's most appropriate for and applicable to your individual dog. Dr. McNulty, thank you so much. You bring up a, a, a lot of very important points. And for myself and the rest of the people viewing, it's very exciting to have another dog aging project expert to chat with today. So thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> another topic that, that comes to mind, and we've, we've re briefly touched on this, um, is, you know, when we care for our senior pets, we really need to stay tuned in to changes um, and sort of take the pet care off of autopilot and really tune into some changes that our seniors are showing us. Um, it's it's easy for us to dismiss a dog's, uh, a dog that's sleeping a little bit more as being, you know, always old or, ah, oh, he's lazy now that he's X amount of years old. Um, and it's true, older dogs probably have less energy than our younger ones. Um, but please note, if the, if the changes are progressive, if they are continuing um, and, and or if this is a very sudden change, we note that our, our family companion was relatively normal the last time that we imagined. And then all of a sudden they're just sleeping a little bit more. Um, we would definitely encourage you to investigate these changes uh, with your veterinarian. There can be some hidden um, internal organ function changes, just some hidden causes to this lessened activity that we would definitely encourage you to check out and not dismiss. It's very important with our senior dog, pardon me, with our senior dogs. Um, another thing to discuss, um, you know, we can also find a decline in vision or hearing with our companion animals, just like with humans, whenever we get older. Um, dogs can even experience dementia. And there's a specific veterinary term for canine dis uh, dementia and it's canine cognitive dysfunction or CCD. You've heard about that, right, Dr. McNulty? <laughs> the yeah, <extra>. absolutely. <laughs> nope, you got it. You got it. Um, and, you know, research has shown that dogs with dementia experience some of the same or very similar behavioral changes as humans with cognitive changes, such as Alzheimer's. Uh, which is why it's one of the reasons that dogs are, in fact, very intriguing to research and learn from, because this can expand our understanding of the aging process, right? <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. You know, the, the similarities between dogs and humans in their anatomy, their physiology, their environmental exposures, the way that they manifest their diseases, and then, like you were talking about, their age-related decline, both physically and behaviorally, including cognitive decline, really makes them an excellent model for aging research. And our team is really interested in learning about you know, the cognitive abilities of dogs of all ages, so not just senior dogs, but younger ones as well, and 
again, as I mentioned, you know, we are a longitudinal study. So we get to watch how these dogs' cognitive abilities change over time. I'm really glad that you mentioned that because it gives me the opportunity to mention something very exciting that's on the horizon for the Dog Aging Project. Beginning this summer, we will be reaching out to a small number of our participants um, and ask them to engage in some very fun cognitive assessment games with their enrolled dogs. And we'll ask them to report the findings of those games to us. They're gonna be simple. They're gonna be enjoyable for the whole family, kids and parents, all members of the family. Um, and we're gonna to love to, to learn from what you're seeing from your dogs. Yeah, I think it's really exciting. And I'm, I'm curious to see how my old boy Carmel um, does with these cognitive tasks. He's ridiculously food motivated. So I think the biggest challenge is gonna be keeping him from you know, eating the treat before he's allowed to have it. But, you know, he, he's a good boy. Like he, he listens well and he knows when he's allowed and when he's not. So I think we'll be okay. Well, he's, he's in great hands. So I would agree. Um, I believe we are now to a portion of our discussion where we can take some uh, questions from the forum. So if we have a few extra minutes, there's a, a few that we, we can get around to. Um, we're discussing cognitive dysfunction. Um, and this brings us to a slew of questions that we have received on this topic from previous PAC appreciation events. And we thank you all for your interest in this topic. It's a very um, sensitive and important topic to our team as well. Um, for instance, we have some great questions. I'm just going to get their um, their handles um, correct here from LK Nicely 81, Merrill and K Charles. Thank you for checking in with us. They've all asked about typical behavioral changes that dogs exhibit as they age and um, how we know if those behavioral changes are associated with true cognitive decline, such as CCD, or perhaps something else. What do you think, Doc? <laughs> yeah, no, it's a really excellent question. And I honestly, I'll be honest with you guys up front and say that, you know, sometimes it's really difficult to tell the difference, like even for us veterinarians. But in general, the way I go about addressing any kind of behavioral change in one of my older patients is, first and foremost, to rule out any kind of medical cause for the behavior change. So I start with collecting a complete history of the dog, you know, get a detailed description of what the behavioral change is. Then I do a complete and thorough physical exam to check for conditions like pain, you know, muscle loss, vision loss, things of that nature, because you know, sometimes these are the cause for the dog's behavior change. So for instance, you know, a dog who's becoming more irritable might be simply more painful, um, or a dog who doesn't want to go down the stairs anymore might be having declining vision and might be scared or nervous about going down the stairs. Um, and then additionally, I would certainly do any kind of diagnostic tests that are relevant, giving the behavior change that has happened. So for instance, if I had a dog that was urinating in the house inappropriately, I'd likely perform various types of lab work and urine testing to look for evidence of an underlying condition such as inflammation, infection, kidney disease, endocrine disease, or even potentially cancer, you know, et cetera. Um, if ultimately there was no evidence of a medical cause for the dog's behavior change, then I would evaluate the dog's behavior against some common categorical changes in behavior that we associate with canine cognitive dysfunction. And so, in fact, um, my colleague that I mentioned before, Gray Barnett, um, he actually discussed these categories in more detail in his blog post um, titled Understanding Behavioral Changes in Senior Dogs. Um, but to kind of summarize what he talked about, the categories are kind of best remembered by the acronym DISH-A or DISH-A. And so the D of DISH um, stands for disorientation. So dogs who kind of stare blankly at a wall or get confused in familiar environments or get caught behind pieces of furniture. Um, I stands for changes in interaction with people or other pets, such as you know, new aggression or new attention seeking or new attention avoidance. Um, the S stands for sleep disturbances. So in other words, you know, typically like sleeping during the day and also being restless at night and you know, up and about not able to calm down at night. Um, the H stands for house soiling or having accidents in the house. 
And then the A stands just for changes in activity levels. So for instance, some dogs might have a lower activity level, um, but then others actually engage in repetitive behaviors such as pacing or wandering um, that actually might increase their overall activity level. And so, you know, if the dog's medical evaluation was normal and their behavior fits into one of those above categories, then I think canine cognitive dysfunction would likely be the explanation. And then, you know, from there, I'd have a discussion, you know, with my owner about this condition and what can be done to help them. And so, although there's no cure for canine cognitive dysfunction, just as there's no cure for Alzheimer's disease, um, there are some treatments and interventions that have been shown to improve a dog's cognitive ability and maintain their quality of life at a good level. And the specific recommendations that I would make would be unique for that particular dog and, you know, especially the behavior changes that they are having. But in general, you know, the recommendations generally revolve around, you know, modifications to their husbandry and or their environment, and then sometimes changes in their diet and so sometimes even addition of certain supplements and medications. So, you know, if you think that your dog could potentially have canine cognitive dysfunction, I'd really encourage you to speak with your primary veterinarian about, you know, what's the most appropriate diagnostic workup for your particular pup and, you know, what therapy might be appropriate to begin for them. Um, and overall, there's still a ton to be learned about cognitive function and cognitive decline in dogs. And it's a really active area of research um, for us specifically at the Dog Aging Project. That's right, Dr. McNulty. Um, I'm glad we were able to really expand on this topic. It's very interesting. Um, we also have another question um, from the forum from Ollie Pack, thank you, uh, who began a thread on the dog park um, and was asking what can be done to provide cognitive stimulation for an older dog and whether or not this is an, an important part of caring for our senior dogs. Yeah, that's another great question. And, you know, certainly just as it's important to keep our older dogs physically active, you know, it's equally important to keep them mentally engaged. Um, you know, the old adage that you can't teach an old dog new tricks isn't entirely accurate. Um, although another indicator of canine cognitive dysfunction appears to be difficulty learning new tricks or performing old tricks. So that could potentially be playing in, but however, that certainly doesn't mean that we shouldn't try, and it certainly doesn't mean that older dogs without canine cognitive dysfunction or with early stages can't benefit from cognitive stimulation. And so a few, you know, tips and tricks that you could try at home include, you know, exactly like I mentioned, you know, doing previously learned tricks or trying to teach them new tricks, um, introducing new toys, especially um, puzzle feeding toys. Um, so those are the ones that hold some of the dog's kibble and require them to play with them in certain ways. And then the kibble comes out and they can eat it um, as they're playing with the toy. Um, certainly things like playing hide and seek with, you know, a favorite treat or a favorite toy. Um, encouraging them to have, you know, safe social interactions with other people and other animals. And then simply just, you know, going for walks and letting them explore the natural world and, you know, engage their senses that they still have intact, which oftentimes uh, seems to be at least their nose is still um, good and active as they sniff along, you know, during their during their walks. Dr. McNulty, I'm happy that you mentioned the the puzzle feeders. Those are fun. We've used those in our house, and the dogs have a really good time with it. They the one that we have is a ball shaped um, little toy. You unscrew it, put the food inside, and they nudge it, the dogs nudge it, the ball around, and the, the kibbles sort of trickle out, and they have a whole lot of fun with that, so that's a great recommendation. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, one final question, and I think we have time to get to this because it's also a very important one, and it is from Tisa River 18, again, thank you, um, and it relates to dental care and teeth brushing techniques. Uh, can you speak, Dr. McNulty, to the importance of dental care in senior dogs, really all dogs, but we're talking about senior dogs today, and how we might improve their dental health by brushing their teeth at home along with other regimens? Yeah, absolutely. Dental health is a really important part of dogs' overall health throughout their entire life, but especially as they get older. Um, dental disease, or more specifically periodontal disease, is one of the most common diseases veterinarians see in senior dogs. 
You know, it has the potential to cause pain, inflammation, infection, loss of teeth, loss of the bone around the teeth, and potentially even negative effects on distant organs, all of which I'm sure you know, you know, significantly can compromise a dog's health, longevity, and quality of life. And the big key that I always try to stress to my owners is that all of this could potentially be occurring in your dog without them really exhibiting any obvious outward signs of disease. And so that's why it's so very important to have your dog's oral health evaluated by your veterinarian at every single visit and to follow their recommendations as much as possible regarding dental prophylaxis and treatment. Um, you know, the specific recommendations, of course, will be different for each dog depending on their age, their health status, and their degree of dental disease. Um, but as Harmony mentioned, absolutely one of the best ways that you guys as owners can really help to prevent dental disease in your dogs is at home teeth brushing. So while certain diets and chew toys and water additives certainly can be helpful and you know, I have no problem with those, definitely it's true that nothing quite substitutes for frequent thorough teeth brushing. And I recommend if at all possible to use the dog toothbrush that has the actual bristles as opposed to just the rubber finger toothbrush because it has better mechanical action at removing the plaque from your dog's teeth. But certainly if all they'll tolerate um, is the rubber toothbrush, that's absolutely better than you know, not brushing at all. And what I've found is you know, the easiest way to be successful in brushing your dog's teeth is starting when they're young. So shortly after they've erupted all of their adult teeth, you wanna work up to the point of being able to fully brush you know, all of the teeth in their mouth. And you know, first, just start out by letting them lick the doggy toothpaste. You know, it usually has some kind of great flavor that they love. Um, and then start, you know, one day just brush a couple teeth or just a few teeth, and then eventually, day by day, gradually work up to the point where you're able to brush all of their teeth and make it a daily habit and use as much verbal praise and treats as you need to make it an enjoyable experience for your dog, so that they really look forward to you know teeth brushing time. So, you know, Carmel in particular, although he doesn't exactly love teeth brushing, he does love the treats that he knows he will get if he's a good boy and sits still and lets me brush his teeth. And so, you know, use whatever kind of motivation your dog particularly, you know, um, will, will allow you to get their teeth brushed. Um, so one final point, however, is that if your dog already has gingivitis or periodontal disease, it actually can be quite painful to have their teeth brushed. So if your dog isn't a youngster with like brandy new sparkly white teeth, um, I would strongly recommend that you have your dog's teeth evaluated by your veterinarian to identify any kind of dental disease that should be treated first before you begin teeth brushing so that you avoid causing them any kind of pain or causing them to develop an aversion to you brushing their teeth because it hurts. Thanks so much, Dr. McNulty. That was really a treat to talk about how we can uh, take care of our beloved senior pets as they move through their wonderful years. Uh, so just as a reminder to our pack members watching today, again, thank you. Um, if you have any questions, we would love it if you would head over to the Dog Park Forum and Kelly and I and the rest of our very talented team will answer them as soon as possible. Um, and additionally, we've got something fun coming up next. We're going to hand it off to Amber Kaiser to look at some behind the scenes action from the Dog Aging Project. And we hope to see you all at the dog park. Again, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks so much, everybody. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kellen and Harmony, for coming and having that really interesting conversation today about senior dog care. This topic is consistently one that our participants are always interested in. So we are really grateful to your expertise. Thank you so much. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Amber Kaiser. I work as part of the communications team at the Dog Aging Project. And I wanted to give you a little bit of a status report for where we're at with the project right now. So all of you watching are members of the Dog Aging Project PAC. So you've completed the health and, health and life experience survey. We are just starting to send annual follow-up surveys for the health and life experience survey. So those of you who became a PAC 
around a year ago, should expect to get an email from us asking you to come and update that information and let us know what's changed with your dog's environment or activity levels or health status. So that's coming. And that is how we become a longitudinal observational study, right? We collect information from the same dogs over time throughout their lifetime. And that is really the core of the data set for the Dog Aging Project. It's the most important data that we collect. And so we're super grateful to all of you PAC members who uh, are willing to fill out those really long surveys. Um, fun fact, as part of our, as part of my role at the Dog Aging Project, I do a lot of pilot testing. So I actually have completed the Health and Life Experience Survey probably 10 or 12 times as part of our pilot testing. So what comes next? In addition to the annual follow-up and occasional surveys about other topics like cognitive activities or something like that, we are starting to enroll dogs in three additional studies. Now these are much smaller than the Dog Aging Project pack, which right now has about 30,000 people in it. About half of those PAC members have also uploaded their veterinary electronic medical records for their dog. That group is eligible to join these three additional studies, which we call Foundation, Precision, and Triad. And I'm going to tell you just a little bit about them and where we are in that process. The first thing I should say is that we wish that we had the funds and the resources to be able to enroll everyone in these studies, but we don't. So what we are doing is filling very specific scientific criteria. So among the dogs who are members of the pack, whose owners have also uploaded electronic vet veterinary medical records, we will be selecting dogs that fill certain scientific criteria. We wanna have dogs of all ages and all sizes from a widespread geographic region. And so we will be selecting 8,500 dogs and inviting them to join what we call the foundation cohort. The foundation cohort is the genetic portion of our study. So those dogs um, who are invited to join and whose owners consent to join the project will receive a DNA kit in the mail from us. The DNA kit is used to collect a DNA sample from their dog's cheek, which they send back to our labs. We'll conduct low pass sequencing for those dogs and then we will report back the genetic reports to the owners, but more importantly, we'll be using the information from those genome sequences to correlate them with the information that owners provide on the health and life experience survey so we can start to understand how genetics and environment are interacting to affect health and healthy aging in dogs. I mentioned that I'm part of the pilot testing crew, so I actually was able to pilot test one of our DNA kits with my own dog, Gilda. And I thought that you might enjoy seeing um, how that is in how it goes in action. So um, we're gonna cut to that video. What is it? What is it, Gilda? What is that? Are you really excited to have your DNA tested? Okay. Hi, this is how we do it. <laughs> You're being really good girl. Hey, stay. You're being really good. <laughs> okay. Okay, so that was pretty funny. Gilda was very good, but you could see she wanted to sort of bite the swab or whatever, which is why I was sort of holding her in my arms like that to keep her as calm as I possibly could. I would say, all things considered, we were pretty successful with the kit. So after the foundation cohort, we have a smaller study that we call the precision cohort. This will consist of about a thousand dogs. These dogs, again, are selected um, from members of the Dog Aging Project Pack who have submitted electronic veterinary medical records and will be balanced out for breed background, mixed breed, purebred, age, size, and geographic region as well. Now, the precision cohort is a little bit more involved. 
the plan for this group is that we will send a sample kit in addition to the DNA kit, so this is separate. The sample kit will be sent to the dog owner and they will need to take the sample kit to their primary care veterinarian so their veterinarian can help collect urine samples, fecal samples, a blood sample, and some hair samples. All of those samples then will get sent back to our labs, to a variety of different labs, for um, many different laboratory tests, uh, metabolic tests, toxicology tests, te tests. We'll be looking at the gut microbiome. There is a wealth of information that we can get from these samples. Any extra samples that we collect will be sent to the Dog Aging Project Biobank, which is hosted by the Cornell Veterinary Biobank. And this is a really exciting partnership for us. Um, the Biobank operates at the highest international standards for sample preserva preservation. And then researchers around the world can request to use those samples that we've collected as part of our project in research of their own. We're very, very excited about that partnership. Now, piloting the sample kits has been even more complicated than piloting the DNA kits because we need to make sure that we have all of the right materials in the sample kit to be able to collect the samples we need. We have to make sure we get those to participants who can take them to their veterinarians, that veterinarians know how to um, collect each sample in the right way, and then get that back to our lab really quickly. So we have a couple of slides to show you of how this process is working. Uh, first, we have a lot of instructional materials that we make to make sure participants know what to do and the veterinarians know what to do. So we set up a whole studio and get ready to take footage. In this next slide, you see Harmony, our study participant manager, and her dog, Oh Boy, who are participating as supermodels in the sample collection instructional video. He is, uh, you can see, oh boy, waiting to be a superstar. This is an image of the contents of the kit itself. So as you can see, it's a pretty thorough and complicated set of sample collection materials. And we want to make sure that local veterinarians feel totally comfortable using that. And here is one of the wonderful team members who works at the Cornell Biobank receiving our very first piloted sample kit. So yay, super excited about that. So far we have invited 800 people to enroll their dogs in the foundation cohort and 25 people to enroll their dogs in the precision cohort. So as I mentioned, these are fairly small groups and we're starting slowly to make sure we have all the kinks worked out of the system. The last cohort I mentioned, and I'm not going to talk about it too much right now because we're, we haven't begun implementing this study yet, is TRIAD. That's the test of rapamycin in aging dogs. And this is a clinical trial of the drug rapamycin that Matt Camberline talked about in one of our previous community appreciation events. You may have, have heard him talk about um, the potential of that medication to really improve healthy lifespan in dogs. And that's the goal of the clinical trial, which will consist of about 500 dogs. And that is going to be a, a study that's conducted in collaboration with cardiologists and veterinary cardiologists and, at, and veterinarians at our participating veterinary teaching hospitals around the country. So participants really need to be regionally located by those hospitals before they're even eligible for that study. So we are making excellent progress on these other additional studies. I thought I would field a couple of questions that come up fairly frequently. Sometimes participants ask if they can submit the genetic results that they obtained from other commercially available kits, like Embark um, or Wisdom, I think is the other one. So at this point, we are not set up to collect those data. We are really doing a, a quite different kind of analysis with our sequencing, and uh, so we, we don't have the ability to, to take that information at this time. 
sometimes people ask if they can sign up for these additional studies. And again, as I mentioned, I wish we had the resources um, to invite everyone to join these studies, but we are limited by our grant funding from the National Institute of Aging. And so at this point, we are trying to enroll the dogs that we think will be most informative for our scientific studies for uh, because of a variety of characteristics of the dog itself. Uh, for those of you who aren't invited to join these additional studies, please know that you continue to be an incredibly important part of this project. As I mentioned at the beginning, without the members of the Dog Aging Project PAC filling out the health and life experience survey, we would have nothing to conduct our science on. So that is really the core of what we're trying to do, and we're so grateful to each of you. And this is a lifetime study. We want to maintain a lifelong relationship with you and your dog. And that means there will be additional studies coming up that we haven't even dreamed up yet. And those um, are always ones you'll be eligible for. So finally, the last thing I wanna do before we close off is assure you that we are not just dog people, we like parrots, we like iguanas, and recently behind the scenes, our team sort of threw down the gauntlet for cat pictures, and I thought I would show you some of the Dog Aging Project team cats. So for now, thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to our next event. Take care. One more quick reminder that we're going to be answering your questions on the dog park forum. So go ahead and post your questions on the thread there or post a comment and either way, question or comment, you'll be entered to, ent you'll entered to win our giveaway for some stickers. And as always, the Dog Aging Project is still recruiting. So if a friend or family member or a coworker has a new puppy, nudge them our direction to dogagingproject.org. We love all the dogs. Thank you.